Hi everyone, I'm Laura and I'm the Marketing and Communications Intern for Go Eat Give, where we strive to raise cultural awareness through sustainable travel, education, and food. Um, so to continue with our Destination of the Month events, we're reaching out to National Park and forest experts to dive deeper into the importance of nature and the environment during this time. So today I'm here with our expert, um, Keenan Adams, who works for the United States Department of Agriculture. And he's also currently stationed in uh, Puerto Rico, so super far from Georgia. So hi, Keenan, thank you so much for being here with us today. Thanks for having me, Laura. Yeah, so can you tell us a little bit about your job, what you do and what exactly um, it encompasses right now for those who may not be familiar with the USDA? Yeah, so I work for the agency called the U.S. Forest Service, and I am the forest supervisor, which means essentially I'm in charge of the management and of a piece of land, and that piece of land happens to be El Junque National Forest, or El Junque National Forest, in um, the eastern part of Puerto Rico. It's roughly 30,000 acres, um, and what that entails is Everything. I mean, so I, I say I'm, I'm the equivalent of a, a, of a mayor and a city manager and a park ranger. You know, if you took all three of those jobs and mixed them together. So for the most part, I deal with uh, visitors and maintaining those facilities. Um, but I say mayor because I have to deal with the local politics. I have to deal with trash removal. I have to deal with water infrastructure. Um, and we also administer... Um, a biological program. Uh, so we have a bunch of endangered species that we are managing habitat for, and we even have an aviary that's, um, I guess, uh, procreating and producing an endangered parrot. Wow, so that's, yeah. that really is like, you're, either, you're the president of your own country right there. You have so many responsibilities and so many things to take care of. So um, I guess my question for that is, your team, because that's a lot of duties, a lot of responsibilities to have. You know, how big is your team, your workforce? So at the moment we have about 50 people because of the hurricane. Um, we, we had a, uh, roughly uh, $100 million of hurricane damage. And so we had to staff up. But on a normal circumstance, we're, we're around 30, 35 people. Um, and we have biologists, uh, engineers, recreation people, and, and basic administration and law enforcement as well. Oh, wow. And I'm assuming that you work very closely with the community too, with, with the local people as well. Yes, so we're one of the few places in the United States that's actually striving to do co-management with communities. So rather than having a traditional model where we're the federal government and we manage everything and we tell you what's going on, we listen to you from time to time. We're saying, no, 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 wait a minute, let's, all have a conversation, start at step zero and say, what do we want to do as a community together and manage this piece of land? And um, we're doing that across, at this moment, five communities, but we plan on just spreading that. So the people have an active voice and an active role in manage, managing the piece of land that's surrounded. Them. Um, we actually developed a, an acronym called CIRMUS, Community Interface Resource Management Areas, with a special designation just Oh, wow. So, wow, that's a lot of a lot of responsibilities, but that's great that you're able to be in close contact with the community, you know, working hand in hand with one another. So that's, that's really great. So to kind of start off our questioning, my first question that I want to ask you is, um, why is it important to visit local parks? You mentioned working with the community, you, were, you mentioned about the wildlife. What about the history? Is, how does that play in, in part of the importance? Yeah, so you, uh, unfortunately, when people hear parks, many times they think like Yellowstone, Grand Teton, these great immaculate national parks that are sometimes larger than states. You know, there's parks that are larger than Rhode Island. Um, but there are a bunch of other small local parks. There could be a park that's a quarter of a block long or wide. Um, and it's important for multiple reasons. Uh, that park as a resource and it gives to the people. Sometimes that resource could be water, like El Junque produces 20% of the water for Puerto Rico. Sometimes it could just be simple recreational green space where people can go play soccer. Um, but I would say the most important reason to go is for yourself, for your own well-being. All the 
health and human data are showing that it's, it's very beneficial to have green spaces, but also to learn. So, so there's historical parks as well, where you can actually, there's historical battlefields. You can go learn about um, a moment in history and it's typically managed so you can feel like you step back in time. Um, so you can go for your education, you can, can go for your own health. And, and also being present. So we allocate resources based upon people's engagement of that place. So if there's a park that's underutilized, that's likely going to get you know, less funding in the future where parks that are, um, have a lot of engagement and people are getting use out of it, that typically gets the resources. So I would say visit your local parks and use them because the city managers or county managers are going to give resources to those places if you if you start advocating for them, if you start using them. Okay, hey, yeah. And I think that is a really good topic that you touched on where when you think of national parks, you do think of these big, you know, Yellowstone, you think of the Rocky Mountains. You, a lot of people don't think of just these small little locations that might be maybe five, 10 miles out from them. And especially, you know, in, in every land that's out there is this little small pocket of history that some people may not discover. And so that's another thing I wanted to touch on is, you know, when you do find these, you know, with Puerto Rico, that that's its own culture, so many different aspects of history. Um, when you do, are, when you are maintaining this, you know, area of land, is it, how important is it to reach out to the local community to those, you know, do you, do you work with other small communities, cultural communities to help manage the land, to help spread the word about the history? Yes, um, so, Unfortunately, in Puerto Rico, there aren't any federally recognized tribes, mm -hmm. but that's not to say there aren't Native people here. Um, there's a Taino culture, which is the, there's two tr um, Native tribes, the Tainos and the Caribs. And so, yeah, we, we do have conversations with um, the Taino community. It's a sacred place for them. Actually, El Junque is a um, Taino god. Jukiju is named after uh, the, the Taino god. But yes, it's very important to engage those communities, but also even former landowners. So that land, El Junque was not always owned by the government. Um, about a third of it, I believe, or a little, a third to a half was previously owned um, by farmers and their descendants are still around. And so even talking to those people because it's a piece of their family legacy and it's very important to talk to them um, when you plan on doing something, because you, you, A, you can learn something from them, but B, it's just the right thing to do. Yes. And then uh, there's also another rich history of the CCC, the Civilian Conservation Corps, which essentially built a lot of El Junque and was a big jobs program for Puerto Ricans. Um, and they built some very beautiful structures that are still standing. Oh. And I think that's always something cool when you have something in history that happened several years ago still standing today for us to be able to visit and, and learn about. So our second question is, um, with your job, with your a lot of responsibilities and things that you manage, what's something that you've learned um, that you wish more people are aware of? You know, um, I wish people would, a lot of people know about national parks, but they don't know about national forest. And so I wish people could understand the distinction between the types of land. So we have national parks, which is administered by the National Park Service. And those are typically for preservation. And those parks were set aside because there was a very distinct historical, cultural, natural aspect of it that we wanted to preserve so you can learn and go back in time and see. Then there are national wildlife refuges, but those are set aside for wildlife um, and they're a little different. They're more in conservation, um, where they're making wildlife first, but still it's a very cool experience to go visit. The national forests are for multiple use. Um, not here, but like in Colorado, you can have horseback riding, skiing, lodges, I mean, just name it. But those are designed for everybody to enjoy sustainably. Um, and they have national grasslands, which are very similar. So I, I wish people would, um, just learn more about the types of land and the types of things that they can do if you like fishing or hunting. A refuge is a very good place to go. Yeah. And that's interesting. I think before speaking to you, I didn't really have that distinction between parks, forests, wildlife conservation. So I do agree that that is something, a really good distinction to have, you know, because each section has its own 
um, focus, its own mission. Mm -hmm. So that's, yeah, I do agree. So with that, um, when people, when visitors do come to these parks, to these wildlife conservations, to these forest locations, how can they care for the environment? What are some steps that they can do to be sustainable visitors? So first is about what you can do. And I would um, look, tell people to look up Leave No Trace. It's a philosophy, but essentially, the whole idea is to leave it in a better condition than when you found it. I mean, if everybody does that, then we will not experience the uh, tragedy of the commons. I mean, we get trashed on the weekends. People just leave trash all over the place, or uh, people do graffiti, things like that. Um, so I would check out leave no trace principles um, and, and just understand and learn those. The, the second thing I would say is, you know, it's great to go to a park at forest, but I would all, there are so many cool experiences around those places. Those places are anchors and there are a lot of other things that develop and happen around them. And I would really encourage people and, and your generation and my generation, we are looking for way more authentic experiences and spontaneity when we travel. We're not the folks that want to go on a cruise ship and eat a buffet and just go to a port and buy tourist trinkets and, uh, and then get back on the ship. That's not how we travel. Not the same thing wrong with that, but we just travel differently. So there are a lot of companies that are trying to facilitate these very authentic experiences. Um, so if you're visiting Puerto Rico, there's a great one that we partner with called Local Guest, and they really try to um, develop sustainable programs where the money's going to the communities. A lot of times these communities are getting an unfair contract. And so they really try to focus on fair contracts um, and, and fair pricing. So uh, I would say try to find a, res a socially responsible company that does stuff like that. And then you can have some really cool, authentic, spontaneous experiences um, in and around the, the piece of public land that you want to visit. That is true. I, I do think that when you do go to these big attraction spots, it's usually the hole in the wall places that make up the, the whole experience. The places that you don't really find on a map, you're just walking around and then you want to go in there. Um, I do agree that a part of the experience is trying to get an authentic feel of the community, you know, taking a step back and looking around to see the type of people there, the type of food, the type of culture. So I definitely agree with that, that those places can be anchor spots, but it's just what's around there that can make the experience 10 times better. So, yeah. yeah so, um, with COVID, I know COVID is still a thing that's going on in America and especially in, in especially in Puerto Rico and other places too. Um, how can people visit parks safely, you know, taking in taking into account COVID? So I would really advise the CDC guidelines, the local guidelines, and then the park or the forest or the refuges guidelines. I would educate yourself beforehand on what you should and should not be doing. Um, but a, a lot of places, so for example, we're actually implementing a reservation system where you have to, ahead of time, go to recreation.gov to get a, um, like a ticket to come in. And it's a free ticket, but just uh, what we're trying to do is flatten the tourism curve, as I call it, right? And so we have a problem of overcrowding in a lot of these tourist places. And just like COVID, we want to figure out what the capacity is and get to that capacity and then flatten over time. And you can do that by a reservation system. Um, so I, I would say go to places that aren't going to be crowded, that are managing responsibly. Um, Puerto Rico is named the top 10 destination being that state that are taking a lot of precautions. But I, I would do your research on what is that state or county or country doing to protect visitors in their hotels and the restaurants. Um, which airlines are taking good precautions, but I would really advise to check out the CDC guidelines and understand what those are, what that they mean, and then go to places where you can um, actually do those uh, responsibly. Oh yeah, and I do agree that, especially there's always new information going on about how to protect yourself, new measures to take, especially you know when you're out going groceries and especially when you're out trying to enjoy nature. So. Um, yeah, these guidelines are very important for people to follow. 
And I do, I think it's really great that a lot of national parks, a lot of locations, these conservations are taking measures, doing the social distancing, doing the capacity limit, um, and then doing the reservations. So I think that's something really great. Do you think that's something that's going to be sticking once COVID is over? Is, do you think that social distancing is going to have a part in, in um, you know, visiting these landmarks and, and places? It's a very good question. Um, I think if we as a society change, and um, when this thing is over, if we change the way, like, why are we shaking hands? <laughs> you know, things like that. If we change our behaviors, I believe in the, the, the parks will. Um, but if we go back to normal, like, I got a feeling we'll, we'll go back to normal. <laughs> uh, I mean, just, just, I, I don't know. I, I know if we're going to be a lot more cautious, especially back during flu season, thinking about this is waking us up to, you know, how do we deal with crowding and how we should manage. And I think there will be some slight changes, but I really think it's going to trend with society and how do we change. All right. Well, this was something really great and interesting to talk to you about. And I learned a lot from just being able to interview you in these questions. So thank you so much again, Keenan, for your time and letting me just interview you. Thank you so much. Oh, oh it was my pleasure. Have a good one. You too. Thank you.